Production funding for Living Smart with Patricia Gross is underwritten in part by Halliburton. Are you tired when you wake up and your significant other complains you snore? You might be one of 70 million Americans with sleep problems. Find out how to get a good night's sleep next on Living Smart. I'm Patricia Gross. Welcome to Living Smart, the show designed to help you get the most out of life. Today's guest, Dr. Todd Swick, can tell us why we can't sleep. Millions of Americans are not getting the sleep they need to function effectively. A pioneer in the field of sleep medicine, Dr. Swick will show us what to do. Have pen and paper ready. We'll be giving you a list of resources at the end of the program. About 70 million Americans suffer from sleep problems, and usually everyone can fall asleep one time or another at daytime. But when you do it often or while driving, it can have dire consequences. Bail bondsman Felix Kubosh learned the truth about sleeping after years of fatigue and sore throats. Every morning when I'd wake up, the back of my throat would, would, uh, would be sore. I was taking about an hour nap almost every afternoon. Felix, how are you? I'm doing wonderful, Doc. It's good to see you again. Good to see you. That was before he met sleep specialist and pioneer, Dr. Todd Swick, and finally got the CPAP machine. CPAP means continuous positive airway pressure that keeps patients breathing throughout the night with the appropriate amount of oxygen they need for a good night's sleep. I believe it saved my life. My blood oxygen level, according to the doctor's study, showed that I was falling into the 66th percentile rate, and now it stays in the 90s, and um, uh, I, I'm fully rested in about five hours. Dr. Swick Looking diagnosed good. him with obstructive yeah, sleep wonderful. apnea, a common right. disorder which causes irregular airflow okay, when you sleep. Off, yeah. This okay. makes you very tired, and it is also linked now, with high blood pressure, diabetes, data, heart disease, like stroke, really nervous, weight gain, simple. depression, and memory loss. But that point, is only one of many sleep disorders Dr. Swick diagnoses and treats at his Institute of Sleep Medicine. Sleep study, and then we'll be able to see how you've improved. One of the top doctors in the field, Dr. Swick launched his career in medicine in 1964. When he won first place for a pacemaker he invented in New York Science Fair, he was only 15 years old. In 1967, I built an artificial heart. I actually won a prize by the American Veterinary Medical Association because the work that I did was for dogs. Dr. Swick had volunteered and trained every day after school with Dr. Doris Asher at New York's Montefiore's Hospital, the first to invent a cardiac pacemaker in the United States. A, very functional a woman physician in 1965 was almost unheard of, not to mention the fact that she was in charge of the cardiac catheterization division of the Albert Einstein School of Medicine. Doris was unbelievable. She took me under her wing, and let me tell you, it was quite a wing. Th this woman trained some of the best cardiologist in New York City at the time. Todd the inventor was chosen out of 400 applicants to attend medical school at Stony Brook in New York where he specialized in neurology. Only 22 students were accepted. When I discovered in medical school the ultimate machine, which is the brain, I said this is what I want to do. His father, a mechanical engineer, had always supported his son and taught him electronics and basic engineering skills. I'm rather surprised at his thoughts he, I appear to be speaking to somebody much older. And that a flip of a notion, he's back to a juvenile again and thinking the way a young boy would think. In 1982, his brilliant medical and mechanical mind would lead to the new field of sleep medicine. At the time, there were no sleep labs in Houston, so he decided to build one with his own hands. Well, I sat down one afternoon at my EEG machine and I knew how to attach sensors to it, other than just the ones that go on the head to read electroencephalograms. I built my own sensors, and I stayed up that night with the patient, and sure enough, we were able to document periods where he stopped breathing, and I was hooked. First thing that's very obvious is that there's a tremendous amount 
of snoring. Even Today, he and his second wife, one of the first sleep medicine technicians in the country, run the Houston Sleep Center, diagnosing the myriad of sleep problems people face. Okay, Mr. Kubash, we're going to be putting these electrodes on you tonight. Patients spend the night at one of the ten state-of-the-art sleeping rooms that are monitored by sleep technicians to discover the nature of their sleep problems. <laughs> After over 400 hours training in sleep medicine, Dr. Swick trains other doctors to recognize the serious medical issue. Too many doctors out there and, and the lay public think that, you know, the biggest problem that you have when you sleep is you snore. The central nervous system is fluctuating tremendously, that the brain activity is fluctuating tremendously, that the cardiovascular system is fluctuating, and all of these things play upon one another. Todd and his wife Marilyn have no plans of retiring anytime soon. Come on, Daisy. Just like his patients, getting a good night's sleep is important to them. Dr. Swick has to wear his own CPAP machine. I want people to remember me as a doctor who truly cared about the field he's in, the patients who have sleep disorders and who can come to me and know that I'm going to care enough to get them better. Anybody that snores a lot and that's fatigued during the daytime, they find themselves drowsy, uh, have, a, have a sleep study. I mean, it could add years to your life. Okay, Mr. Wash, good night. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Swick. It's great to have you here. It's my pleasure. Um, 70 million Americans, that sounds like a lot of people walking around cranky, not knowing why they're cranky and they're tired. Why is it that we can't, uh, we don't seem to get a grasp on this? Well, our entire culture has changed over the past hundred years. We have lost on average of an hour and a half sleep from 1900 to 2000. Blame it on things like the electric light bulb, things like radio, television, and now, more recently, computers. Right. Things of this nature are robbing us of our sleep. Right. The human body was not meant to have a, a declining hours of sleep. You need an increasing amount of sleep. And we call that an accumulated sleep debt. Okay. As we build the sleep debt, it's like taking money out of the bank and not replacing it. Eventually, comes time to pay the piper. Right, right. Now, what are the most common uh, sleep problems that people have in America? I think we should divide it into difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep. Right. And those people who have problems during the nighttime sleep where they're actually sleep deprived, mm -hmm. resulting in daytime sleepiness. So you have those folks who can't sleep and those folks who have a feeling of too much sleep during the day. Now, if you snore too loud or your significant other snores too loud, is it something we need to look at? You, you don't laugh at it. You need to look at it, right? Oh, absolutely. The numbers are if you take 100 people who snore, probably 30 percent or 30 out of the 100 will just have snoring. And that in of itself may not be significant other than to disturb your bed partner. But a full 70% will have a medical condition called sleep apnea. And that runs the gamut of mild stopping of breathing during the night to very severe, prolonged periods where oxygen levels drop, carbon dioxide levels go up, you put your brain at risk, you put your heart at risk, and it becomes a very serious medical condition. What are some of the, people don't know this, what are some of the signs that they have during the day besides kind of being sleepy uh, that, that, that should warn them, hey, you need to get a sleep study? Well, if you are sleepy during the day and you think you're getting the requisite number of hours in bed, then there's something wrong with the bedtime that you're spending. Right. Because you should be able to function through the day feeling awake and alert and able to concentrate. If in the middle of the afternoon you find that you really can't keep your eyes open, your head's nodding, your eyes are blinking, you're yawning, something's wrong. And if you snore, there's a very good correlation that the two are connected. The sleep study, I assume that must be expensive. Is there, does the insurance cover that? Because I know sleep medicine is pretty much a new field. It's probably the newest field in medicine 
really it started in 1978. So, yeah, it's, really it's, it's new. very new. And does insurance cover uh, sleep studies? For the most part, it they does. Do. So you have to go and, and get that check for sure and do the sleep study. And there's many myriad of, of issues uh, besides sleep apnea. You've also got insomnia and uh, there's restless leg syndrome. What's that about? Well, restless legs is where you develop a very odd and uncomfortable sensation in your legs. And it doesn't have to be the legs. It can be the arms. But for the most part, it's the legs that literally prevents you from relaxing. It comes on when you expect to relax, when you expect to wind down, get into bed, sit in an easy chair. Right. And all of a sudden you have this feeling in your legs that the only way you're going to get rid of is to get up and move. This is a very common issue. In fact, we call it the most common disease you've never heard of. <laughs> And what causes that? Is it iron? I've read it's iron or lack of iron? Or? We don't really know the exact mechanism. We know it has something to do with iron and something to do with a neurotransmitter called dopamine, mm -hmm. which is also the transmitter that's at fault in patients with Parkinson's. So there's a lot of basic science that's literally begging to be done at this point. Right. And we're making great strides, but we can treat it with medication and it's just one of 95 different sleep disorders. Snoring and restless legs are just two. Um, now, I know that restless legs apparently affects more women than men. What is the difference between men and women in sleep? I understand that sleep problems are more prevalent in women. Is that right? Things like insomnia are more prevalent in Why women. Why is that? It has to do with hormones. Okay. Uh, monthly cycle changes how you sleep. Periods uh, during the month, as you get close to ovulation, sleep hormones will change. As a woman menstruates, sleep hormones change. So there is the insomnia issue. In terms of sleep apnea, that's more of a male disease if you compare age match controls. Women develop sleep apnea after the menopause. Okay. It's been shown, and we're pretty sure that Things like progesterone and perhaps estrogen literally protect the woman against having things like sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. But after the menopause, it becomes equal. The number of women equal the number of men. But it is clearly a male predominance in the 20s and 30s. And again, we're dealing with a very changing kind of picture. As our society gets heavier... And as people do less exercise and maintain more 24-hour, seven-day-a-week cycles, the incidence of sleep apnea is just exploding. Right. Well, obesity is tied to sleep apnea, right? Absolutely. Let's talk about that. What are, I know that the treatment for sleep apnea tends to be a CPAP, what they call the CPAP machine, right? That's correct. Tell me about the CPAP machine and how difficult it is to get used to it, because I know a lot of people complain about it, but, but it's a godsend once you use it, right? Oh, absolutely. The machine works by creating a positive air pressure within the throat. And, and the example that I like to use for my patients is, have you ever tried to suck a malted out of a straw? I mean, this really thick malted, as you try and draw it up in the straw, the straw collapses. And that's what happens to the throat in susceptible people. As you inspire, the walls collapse. And just like in a straw, to clear it and to open it up, you blow down into the straw, and that opens up the straw. That's what CPAP does to the throat. Air going through the nose, splints open the muscles, keeps you breathing, stops your snoring, but most importantly, it keeps your oxygenation up and prevents all the consequences that we spoke about in terms of blood pressure changes and heart rate and brain activity right. that are at fault. Now, why is it so difficult to get used to it? Because I know it takes about a month, right, to, to get oh, once it, you get it. Absolutely. Why is it? Because you're just not used to having something in your face. Yeah. I mean, here you are. You know, I, if people talk, call it the Darth Vader look. <laughs> uh, so you've got this thing, contraption, that's over your nose and even sometimes your nose and mouth. And you've got this constant stream of pressure. Right, right. Some people are claustrophobic. Other people just react poorly to this constant airflow. And I can speak from personal experience that it took me about three weeks to right. get used to it. Right. And here I was in the field for 20 years. But it makes a huge difference. Yeah, it's a mask you've got to love. 
It's like mask out of love. And, and I understand that there's like personality changes that you've noticed in your patients after they start using the mask. It, it creeps up on them. It, it's the kind of thing that if you've got mild to moderate disease, you really don't appreciate the severity of it because it only comes about after you've been wearing it for a while. And if you go for a night, as I did when my mask tore, that... I realized I woke up the next morning feeling like a Mack truck had hit me. And my patients tell me the same thing. Amazing. That it just changes everything. The energy that they have the next day, their ability to concentrate at work and at home, their ability to exercise improves, their outlook improves significantly. You know, I always wondered, um, I, I, fortunately I get, a, I get a pretty good night's sleep, I wonder, when you dream, does it mean that you sleep have, you, your sleep is better, or does it make any difference? Well, it's an interesting point. We all dream. And, mm-hmm. and dream sleep occupies about 25% of the night. Normally, we go into a dream state every 90 minutes. So the first 90 minutes of your sleep, you normally don't dream. If you go into a dream state, as soon as you get into bed, something's wrong. Right. People with sleep apnea who have severe sleep fragmentation can do it. People who have narcolepsy, which is another sleep disorder where you have uncontrolled sleep attacks, can go right into REM sleep. Mm -hmm. So the timing of the REM onset is important. The content, that's a whole other story. Right, right. And, and, and that I will leave to my friends <laughs> in, the, exactly. in the psychiatric the field. The dream analysis people. Exactly. Um, what about if you don't want to use sleep apnea? Are there other options for you if you have a sleep apnea? There are, uh, albeit not nearly as good. Right. And, and we have to separate it out. One is not the equivalent of the other. There are devices that people can wear in their mouth that literally take the lower jaw and extend it out. And mm-hmm. by doing that, you increase the spacing between the back of the tongue and the back of the throat. Major surgery, though. Yeah. Major surgery. Well, that's surgery, but there are also oral devices. We call them MADs, mandibular advancement devices that can pull it forward. There are problems because it really doesn't, you don't have a lot of room there to play with, so you're increasing the space just by a small amount. But it's not as effective. But if there are people who cannot tolerate it, and it's certainly better than nothing. Right. Controversial sleep medicine. We were hearing all kinds of stories, people getting up in the middle of the night, driving a car, and they're not, they don't remember anything. What's going on with sleep medication? How safe are they? The, it's interesting. The number one prescribed drug in the world is Ambien. I had no idea. It's the number one prescribed medicine, and this is worldwide. And you're talking millions of people who are using it. So when something bad occurs, statistically, it's going to be because Mm -hmm. of the number one drug. The reality is that if you take this drug as prescribed, it is a very safe drug, as are all of the other sleeping pills, Lunesta, Sonata, and and even the newer ones called Rosarum. But if you take these drugs with alcohol, if you take these drugs and then for some reason, go drive a car or do something that requires mental alertness, you're going to fail. It's going to, right. There are going to be problems. If you have a history of sleepwalking, sleep talking, this drug can bring it out. It gets worse. It can get worse. Okay. So you, it, it's not a drug that you can just prescribe to anybody. There has to be some thought involved. Uh, could they be addictive? The older drugs could be. The new ones are more psychologically addictive than they are physically addictive. People become uh, accustomed to using it and to assuming that sleep comes in a bottle. And without the bottle, there's no sleep. That's not good. And in my practice, we have to dissuade people of that notion. And I tell them, sleep does not come in a bottle. Right, right, right. Um, How how about over-the-counter medications that people use to, to sleep and to stay awake? Because no. a lot of people are taking no-dose or whatever uh, is out there for to, to stay awake. How safe are these over-the-counter medications? Well, I know so many people who take a pill to go to sleep and then take a pill or a drink awake. to stay awake. The over-the-counter sleeping aids can be used for one or two nights. Everybody can 
certainly, do that, right? you know, look in their own lives and say, yeah, you know, big test tomorrow, big interview. Right. So there are times when it's not a bad idea to get some help. But when you start using these medicines three, four, five, even seven nights a week, they can change issues in your breathing. They can change issues in how your lungs work, how your heart works. It is not a smart thing to do to use these for extended periods. The medicines that we use to stay alert, the number one medicine is coffee. And coffee does work. Right. But I have patients who drink eight to ten cups a day because they think that they need it to stay alert. The problem is that their nighttime sleep is disrupted, so the need for the stimulant. Right. Medicines that doctors give for illnesses, almost all of them affect sleep. Right. And so the doctor has to know, if there's a sleep complaint, how to do the timing of taking of the drug. Okay. Very important. And looking at all the drugs that you're taking. Absolutely. To see what, how they interact. The number one drug is alcohol. Okay, that's the problem. And that's a big problem. And the reason is, alcohol, of course, is a sedative when you first take it. But what people don't realize is that as the body breaks alcohol down, it becomes a stimulant. It wakes you up. It wakes you up. So you have people who take this drug, and alcohol is a drug, and four hours later, their eyes are open like shades, and there's and no closing coffee. them. <laughs> and they want coffee. <laughs> they, they, they want something because they can't stay in bed. Right, right. Um, you obviously sleep well. How do you know you're uh, living smart? Because I do practice what I <laughs> preach. Okay. When I started using CPAP, it was <laughs> my wife's uh, plaintive cry that convinced me I needed to do it. But the benefit for me was enormous. Uh -huh. It took me about a month to get used to it and then about three months to really feel the difference. And I'll tell you, it, it has made me feel so much better. You're just pleasant all the time now, right? <laughs> you were already ask. pleasant. You were already pleasant. Um, let's talk about sleep hygiene. You mentioned coffee. You mentioned alcohol. Those are two, um, I don't, you can't call it coffee a drug, but it is a stimulant. Oh, sure. Um, these are things that we need to be looking at. Tell me, share with me some of the tips we can give people to get a good night's sleep if they, you know, they have a regular, they don't have a disease or something serious like sleep apnea. I think you need to start off with the definition of what is a sufficient amount of sleep. And it varies for everybody. It's the amount of sleep that you take during the night that allows you to fall asleep without the use of sleeping aids, sleep through the night, and wake up feeling refreshed. Now, the average is seven hours. Okay. But there are people who can do that on four hours and people who need 12 hours. It's a big bell-shaped curve. So... You know, not one size fits all. Right, right, right. But for the average individual, we recommend that, number one, you maintain the same sleep onset and sleep offset seven days a week. Okay. One of the big problems is that people tend to sleep in on weekends, and getting out of bed Monday morning sometimes requires a small thermonuclear reaction. <laughs> <laughs> because because you've shifted your time. Right, right, your cycle. So, right, so you want to be able to sleep the same time seven days a week. Okay. You want to be careful of exercise. Exercise creates an abundance of excitatory and stimulatory hormones in the body, so you don't want that too close to bedtime. We typically tell people not within four hours of bed. Stay away from coffee within four hours of bed. Stay away from alcohol within four hours of bed. Allow yourself decompression time before you get into bed. Lots of people bring all their worries and all their concerns and all the issues that they deal with all day long into the bedroom. You've got to find a time to think about these things and then cut it off. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Swick, for joining us. It's been my pleasure. And for more information on Dr. Swick and the Institute of Sleep Medicine, you can call them at 713-827-8896. That's 713-827-8896. Or check their website at houstonsleepcenter.com. Another great resource is the National Sleep Foundation. You can call them at 202 
202-347-3471. That's 202-347-3471. Or visit their website at sleepfoundation.org. And remember, if you're not getting enough sleep, you will not be as happy, productive, and energetic as you need to be. So get help if you need it. Please remember to visit our website, houstonpbs.org slash livingsmart, for a complete resource list, and feel free to share your own advice on getting a good night's sleep. You can call us with your comments at 713-743-8513 or email livingsmart at houstonpbs.org. And that's our show for today. I hope you'll sleep well tonight. Make sure you tune in to our next episode. If you or anyone you know has ever been diagnosed with Lyme disease or other unexplained medical conditions such as fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, or tension headaches, our guest, Lyme support group member Kathleen Zabawa, will walk you through some interesting information on this mysterious disease. I'm Patricia Gross. Have a great week. Thank you.